that it needs to. I'm really loud for everyone who knows me. Um, okay. <laughs> like I'm not that tall. Um, is this working? Okay. So for those who don't know, um, earlier this year, a bunch of us, 20 of us to be exact, um, 13 writers, six artists, and myself got together and we started discussing what it would be like if we saw newness in Desi literature. And the reason why we asked this question is because we thought there was a certain amount of uniformity and just, you know, tiresomeness in the sort of narratives we were getting from famous South Asian writers um, who got their books published and read by Western audiences and were disseminated widely, right? Um, so the question I asked myself was, wait, but where are the traditions for, I don't know, horror or erotica or speculative fiction? Where are they? And who are those writers who's doing them? Who are they inspired by? So I pitched the idea to the literary magazine I worked at at the time, and, um, and, they, and they said yes. And I sat down to what I thought was going to be super fun, and it was eventually, but... <laughs> but um, first, I had to read the, read the works of 100 South Asian writers. And by South Asian, I mean people who are either, either live in or have ancestry from um, India, Pakistan, Kashmir, um, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Nepal. And so I sat down with 100, which, mind you, was a low number, actually, because you can imagine how vast that is for the 1.5 billion people, approximately, that live in that region. Um, so I sat down and I read them, and it took me a while, and then eventually I realized that I was discovering people and traditions that I genuinely had never even thought could exist, right? Um, a few of those examples are on the panel today, and we'll be reading for you. Um, but I think what was the most fun about this was that we got to collaborate not just as writers and as, and as editors, but the writers spoke to each other. The writers spoke to the artists. The artists came up with, um, there were you know, five female and, and or non-binary um, artists who worked on the issue, who worked collaboratively with each writer to make the, the artwork that you saw earlier on the projector. And what they did was, I think, just incredible, right? They really queried the nature of what we're doing, right? Now, the, the title up here, is interesting, particularly because it turns out that they see is a contested term. It is not that cut and dried, right? So who has claimed to a DC is a is less of a concern than who wants to claim they see. As it turns out, a lot of people in our in our issue felt that they didn't really care all that much about the word DC, which for me was a little bit of a surprise initially. But that's because I've been born and raised in Pakistan, right? Um, for people who've been born and raised elsewhere, who have different life experiences, entirely different contexts, it's been entirely different. And that's what's wonderful about this, right? I, we didn't have to disagree at any point. All we needed to do was take that disagreement and put it up there for people to see. And so when we published it, we got this incredible response that I think we're still sort of processing because we're not exactly sure. Um, you know, the, the volume of it was a little, was a little overwhelming. And um, for those of you who might be interested in, um, you know, the, in the AWP conference at, um, in San Antonio next year, we're going to have a panel there as well. But we're really, really excited to have panelists over here, three, three writers and one artist who are going to be talking to you and reading, reading from their work and then, to, and then we're going to be talking about Desi traditions, literature, what it means to be a Desi writer at this point in time, um, if we want to use that word. And um, without further ado, what I want to do is introduce the first reader on our panel, Abir Hoke. Um, who, by the way, was um, an incredible revelation to me, and she was one of the few writers who I didn't just read one book, I read two. I was just like, okay, well, I'm definitely gonna solicit her, and she's definitely gonna say no, but why not just read more of her work? So, and you'll find out why when I read her bio. Abir Hok is a Nigerian-born, Bangladeshi-American writer and photographer. She likes courageous ones, th thunderstorms, and chili garlic paste. 
Her books include a travel photography and poetry monograph, The Long Way Home, 2013, a linked collection of stories, poems, and collections, The Lovers and the Leavers, 2015, and a memoir, o Olive Witch, 2017, which is incredible. Um, so without further ado, Abir Hoke, everyone. Thank you, Kamil. Kamil is like the, it's kind of the heart behind this issue. And I really highly encourage you to go look at the Barrel House they see, uh, or in Bangla, they she, road trips issue. There's got, it's just got so much like amazing all over the map in terms of genre um, writing and some of the most awesome artwork as well. So I'm gonna read just a f the first few pages of my piece. Um, uh, hopefully there's no one, you know, it's like NSFW. Um, it's called Gaul. She first saw Shore at a pub in town. The place was like a cellar with wooden pillars and awkward places, which made it hard to dance, but easy to look all angles. Galway was thronged per its Saturday usual. Pubs packed, the cobblestone streets streaming with people. The weather was warm, and there was a sheen on people's faces, more than just the drink. Shure stood out, dark skin, lean body, shining teeth. The fellow he was talking to was from Dublin, but Shure was something else, Asian or West Indian or something. Whatever it was, was far from home. Except he seemed r just right where he was, leaning with liquid grace against the cold stone wall, going on about football. He was wearing a gray rocker tank top and jeans molded to his hips, slung low. Ashlyn wanted to touch, feel for that hip bone she knew was just above his belt loops. Ash, I see a fine thing too, Neve laughed, her mouth a watercolor slash on her pale face. The music was a tinny 80s mix. Ashlyn wanted something more mellow or another beer. But the boy was on his way out with his mate, having noticed nothing. Ashlyn wasn't in the picture, not yet. She looked at her reflection in the glass. She knew she didn't have that pull. She was short, plump, ruddy. She looked the part, a social worker who did children's cases. Her hair was always a bit of a frizz, her clothes never the right cling for her curves. But sometimes, just sometimes, she had gall. It made up for the rest. Ashlyn would never forget the first time Gall got her off. She was in the back seat of the car with Johnny, the boy king footballer from school, and his on again, off again girlfriend. Neve had been driving with a friend from Dublin up front, so Ashlyn had gotten stuck in the back. They were going to the limestone cliffs, the, bur the burrens, though it promised, promised a washed out affair, raining like mad. Even with the cold and wet, it was some kind of beautiful. There was enough light in the sky that sometimes a curtain of wet would sweep aside and the fields would shine out like spotlights, patches of clover leaf, mud gold earth. Johnny in the back was all elbows, Never mind Ashlyn, who was getting poked and pushed as he worked at the old game. His girl was playing the prude, so he was snogging her face off. Neve drove the car over a hump, and everyone swallowed air. On the come down, Johnny sat flat on Ashlyn's hand. Another hump and lift, and in trying to get her hand out, all Ashlyn managed was to turn it palm up, just about between his legs. She was trying not to laugh when she realized it felt good. The weight and the warmth between his legs. She gave it a squeeze, and it felt even nicer. The cliffs of Moor were rising up, and the sun too, like it knew the story. The wind went on slapping their little car around. She could tell it was going to be pure cold when they got out, so she cuddled in while she could. Then Johnny started cuddling back his hips anyway. She felt him rock ever so gently into her hand. His own hand came around back behind him, finding the crotch of her jeans like some homing sex pigeon. She marveled at his marksmanship, but it was more than that. 
He knew what to do when there was denim in the mix. How much more to grab, how much harder to press. And he was still kissing his girl, his back to Ashlyn. She could feel herself getting hot, her hand weakening even as his strengthened. He pulled and pressed and squeezed and stretched through the fuck all denim. And all the while, the cliffs kept coming on like a parade, the sea, a gray blue collar up against a craggy limestone neck. Ashlyn tried to keep her eyes open to see if her growing arousal would change anything, brighten or telescope the sky. But it was hard enough keeping quiet. Thank the good Lord, Neve had the radio on and was chatting up her mate. When Ashlyn came, she let out only the faintest moan, drenching her drawers. The next thing she knew, Neve was getting out of the car and the air draped down like a wet blanket on her flushed face. Before she could open her door and face up to the towering cliffs, Johnny pulled her towards him. He pushed his hand inside the front of her jeans, his middle finger sliding in slick. His hand was out and he, was, he had bounded out before she could say anything, his finger in his mouth. The next time she saw Shore, he was bartending at a loud, filthy pub. Neve noticed him first. They were getting drinks at one end, Neve doing the honors in case she knocked down the bill. She was wearing a tight green polo shirt with all the buttons undone, leaving nothing to the imagination. Ashlyn herself was wearing a new wisp of a dress that matched the pale blue of her eyes and it had a twirling cut. It was also a bodice clutcher with sweet little buttons leading all the way down. But next to Neve, nothing seemed to matter. It's your ride, Neve murmured, deadly. Sure did look ready to eat. He appeared to be wearing the same clothes as last time, fitting jeans, narrow tank top. <clears throat> his arms were muscled, his arse perfectly outlined, but it was his face that Ashlyn liked best, full lips, shining eyes, trophy smile. I'll get in the next round, Ashlyn said, though with Neve it was just plain quicker. Ashlyn could already see Shore in her little house, sitting on her bed with the quilt Grams had stitched for her, his dark skin making everything look lighter, brighter. For once, she didn't feel the usual pang of Graham's death, because Graham hadn't taken well to Ashlyn's love, last love, and he was just from the north. It'd have been a holy show wherever Shore was from. Outside, it was bucketing down, gals stumbling in wearing cling, -lac cling wrap outfits, lads in dripping tees. Ashlyn threaded her way through the damp crowd to the other end of the pub and stood behind a gaggle of gigglers. She knew how to do this from watching Neve. You set your sights and then got yourself through. Though now she were close, it didn't seem as easy as all that. She gathered her gall and pushed herself to the front of a, the bar. A whole song played in the next breath. Did it take Neve this long? Another bartender paced her way but got distracted in the last stretch. She looked at her nails, bitten to the quick, knowing this to be a defeat. Look up, you ninny, look up. She looked up. What can I do for you, darling? Every syllable flattened her. His voice was deep and low, his accent lilting, sing-song, warm. She said nothing, only leaning her arms on the counter, watching him. He settled his forearms across from her and watched her back. What can I do for you, she repeated, laughing, almost in relief. She remembered Neve's sexed up advi advice about imagining lads naked, and she thought about sliding his jeans off him slowly. It worked like clockwork. His teeth flashed. There's a thing or two, he said. He reached out and almost touched her lower lip, drawing his finger past her throat stopping just above her cleavage. Even though she, he hadn't actually touched her, she could feel the trail of his fingers hot and suggestive. Her nipples hardened. She straightened, feeling their tips brush against the edge of the counter. His gaze fell to the minuscule movement and she went scarlet, her collarbones heating up. He returned his gaze to her face. I count down in an hour, he said. Can you wait? She nodded. Here's a pint of the black stuff and one for your friend. 
but mind you find your tongue, he said, smiling. He leaned over the bar unexpectedly and pressed his lips to hers, pillow soft. A small sound escaped her mouth. There's more to it than that, he said. When she went back, she didn't have to say anything. Neve had reckoned the entire scene just watching. I'm going to stop there. You'll have to read the rest of the story. They get it on. All right, so I'm going to introduce Noor Nasreen Ibrahim, who I had the pleasure of interviewing. And we had this one hour Skype conversation, video Skype conversation. And it's so interesting to be able to talk to somebody who you've never met, but you've read their story, and then just ask them all these um, lovely questions about craft and inspiration and motivation. Anyway, I loved, I felt like I knew her already, and this is my first time meeting her tonight in person, so it's, it's really a joyful thing. Noor Nasreen Ibrahim is a television producer by day and a writer by night. Born and raised in Pakistan, she is currently based in the United States. She was a finalist for the inaugural Salem Award for Imaginative F Fiction. Her essays and reviews have appeared in Catapult, The Millions, The Collapsor, and other publications. Her fiction has appeared in Platypus Press's short series, Spectre Magazine, Salma Gundi Magazine, The Aleph Review, Barrel House, and in the Kolan's book of South Asian science fiction from Hatchet, India. Um, and I also want to introduce the uh, artist, Sarah Kayum, who um, illustrated her story. Um, I don't know if Kamil made it clear, but each of the stories was, uh, he commissioned an artist to actually um, create an original work of art. Um, and so Sarah's, um, so I'm just going to introduce really quickly her. Sarah Kayum is an American Pakistani visual artist. She holds a BFA in painting from Boston University and is currently pursuing an MFA in fine arts at the Pratt Institute. Her studio practice ranges from large-scale oil paintings, a combination of representational and abstract visuals, to mixed media installations. And she also worked as a production um, designer for short independent films in Pakistan. She's exhibited her work in Pakistan, the US, the UK, and Japan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abir. Um, I remember when I first read Abir's work, I was like, wow, and did you show this work to any of your family members? And, <laughs> and now my family members are here, so I'm like, wow, I do not know how they will react, but it's an amazing story. Um, so um, this actually, this work by um, Seher is, wasn't actually the work that's featured in um, the Barrel House issue. I'm reading something that's not in the issue tonight. tonight. Um, but this is one of her, one of the, my favorite pieces from her site. It's, um, it's gorgeous. It's basically, this picture is titled, Your Reality is a House of Cards. And I chose it sort of to coincide with the piece I'm reading today, which is um, a story um, titled, Lily Under the Sea. Um, Lily Under the Sea, I wrote for the Alif Review, which is a literary magazine based in Pakistan. Um, and I wrote it in a, because it sort of was, it's set in a place that has a range of people and communities and identities. I wrote it at 4 a.m. when I was ex extremely jet lagged in a hotel room in Doha, where I used to go for work sometimes. And um, as you may be able to tell while I read it, that it was a, Doha was a very strange place and alien, f it was a very alien and kind of dystopic place for me, um, going there for the first time. And so I created some fiction, so let's see. <clears throat> The water is the wrong kind of warm. You feel the hotel guest stares on the back of your neck as soon as you sink into the pool. You are here on borrowed time, purchased for local use and to be discarded. Even the water in this pool does not know this desert or these tiled blue walls. Like you, it is imported. Your back aches from late nights on a soft, unfamiliar bed next to a heaving, sweaty body. The dusty gulf sky sinks into flashing blue, purple, yellow buildings, construction cranes and pale bunkers against dark tents and romantic hotel lights, promising respite. White robes milling around the edges of the pool blur into one long line. Hairy legs interrupt the yellow underwater lights. 
you drip back to your hotel room. With only, your, with only your beaten down suitcase hidden in the corner, walls of white and yellow flowers flo floating against blue, a bed with too many pillows and sheets too smooth to be slept on, this space could belong to anyone. The room, briefly deformed, will snap back into place like a rubber band to accommodate another. It's strange how you've been here for two months. You light your cigarette and inhale. Your employer smokes too much himself to notice your breath when he brings his lips to yours. A golf cart trundles by your veranda, driven by a Filipino man in brown slacks and an immaculate white shirt. He can inhabit a small part of every world, his corner of the room shared with 20 others, his invisible portion of the pristine grass and palm trees of this hotel. You turn your head at the slap of plastic slipper against tile. A man in the swimsuit glides up the path running past your hotel room. His gray hair sticks out around his ears, but his belly is flat. He's clearly accustomed to air-conditioned gyms. On holiday, he says, his eyes traveling up and down your body. He is not Arab. His accent is more like yours. He has pale eyes and a sharp nose. You feel dwarfed by your fluffy white towel. Work, you respond after a pause. Of course, only the crazy, wealthy, or lazy take a holiday here. And which are you? He laughs. I would say I'm wealthy, but never lazy. His laughter is quiet and short, with his breath catching as if he's holding himself back. Drops of water cling to your forehead and trickle down your back. The black swimsuit strap tied around your neck feels flimsy. You wish you had a bathrobe instead. I was just in the pool, you whisper. I know. You surprise the other men with your speed. I prefer that to them staring. They were not staring too much. Their wives were right there. And you? What were you doing? You've spoken to him already for too long. Any moment now, your employer's assistant could knock on your door. He steps towards you, and you see his chest glisten under the moonlight. I was simply admiring you. So you must be one of the crazy ones, you say. Perhaps I am. I haven't seen someone from the motherland in a long time. Before you can respond, he turns and continues up the path, his pale, tall body shining amongst the palm trees. You chose the name Lily when you decided to leave. Lily is written on your passport and your contract. You saw the name on an advertisement for soap. A woman with brown hair, oval face, and skin so bright as though lamps were inserted under her cheeks, stared at you from, from a billboard across the busy street from the agency. Lily, it said, guaranteed to make you bloom. Your paleness was your advantage. When the agency saw you, they created your new passport, took a few headshots, and said they would fast track you to the highest bidder. You once thought you were adopted. After all, your mother and father were darker. Their faces a weathered brown like goat skin hanging from the butcher's shop window. Back home, you could swim, fully dressed in shirt and leggings in a cove nestled in the far corners of the beach, a few feet from huts where holiday goers would laze. Early mornings, you would catch a bus from the cramped township where your parents and two brothers lived, then walk two miles, long robe flapping around your ankles. You found the clothes oddly comforting despite their weight pressing against you. Perhaps their heaviness made you a better swimmer. One day you heard screams and gunfire and you hid in the cove until all the noise subsided. Your mother found you shivering late at night behind a rock and forbade you from ever going back. He picked you from a long list of applicants because of your eyes. They are so big, I can see the ocean inside them, your employer said when you were ensconced in his private plane in high back leather seats that surrounded you like security guards. He was a large man, an Arab with roots in the city, with a quivering lip and hands, a gold ring on his middle finger, a kindly smile that didn't extend inwards. When he wanted you, he began whining in a childlike voice, imagining a rejection that never came. He poured you drinks that made you drowsy. He tells you now how he wishes he could leave his wife and his large house to be with you forever. He tells you how women lined up to work for him, but you were unique. You are exactly what he requested. You drink and curse. You are agreeable and pliant. There are others like you. They sit quietly in the restaurant, some reading magazines, other li others lying by the pool wearing large sunglasses. You notice them by their walk, careful and unassuming, but with a bounce that emerges when their employer arrives. 
Some have cell phones, special dispensations, no doubt, and some wear diamonds. They are appropriately confident and ignore the stares. You want them to know you, but you can't speak up. Sometimes you enjoy his company. He shares his dreams of constructing buildings that touch the sky and finding softness in the coarse desert. His eyes shine with wonder, and you are enthralled by the beauty he constructs in a few words. But you could not sleep that first night, your body sticky with him, and you could not sleep the night after or the night after. Thank you. Thank you. So the next writer is someone that I've communicated with for quite a long time, but we've, again, have not actually met until tonight. And so I feel like I know her really well. Um, this is Sarah Thangam Matthews. Um, she's an amazing writer. She's been published in God knows how many places. And I'm extremely envious of some of her lines. Like I read them and I think that I wish I wrote these words. Um, so <laughs> she grew up between Oman and India, immigrating to the United States at 17. A recent graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, she's fancy, um, where, she was, where she was a Rona Jaff Fellow in fiction. Her stories and essays have been published in the Kenyan Review, Agni, BuzzFeed Reader, and many, many more. So let's welcome Sarah. Thank you, Noor. I don't usually wear heels, so I'm uh, acclimating. Hi, can everyone hear me? Great. Um, wow, it feels very special to be here. I moved to New York pretty recently, and this is my first reading here. So thank you all for being here, and a special shout out to my sister who came, to, came here from DC for this. Um, <laughs> Um, the story that I wrote for the incredible issue that um, Kamil curated, um, the New Daisy Lit issue, is called The Storms, and I'm very fond of it, um, and working with the other writers in the issue made it a lot better. It's a, if you care to read it, because um, I'm not reading it right now, um, it's a speculative story about a Daisy mother and daughter um, fleeing Red Hook as it, um, as it you know, slowly is ravaged by climate change. So today in particular, it felt topical, um, but it's a little confusing to read out loud because of how it handles dialogue. So I'm going to read a different story, which is similar to me in the sense that it also involves the question of how to live a life. And it's about three children, and I'll just start. Um, so this is an excerpt from a story called Rubber Dust. Rubber dust. The little girl with no friends reads at her desk during recess. Usually, she's smart enough to keep her head down when the other second grade teachers come to eat their lunches and gossip at Mrs. Lobo's desk. But Mrs. Thoreen, who teaches 3B, who teaches 3B is getting divorced, and the teachers are all whispering about it, making big, big eyes, saris rustling like dry leaves. The details are almost as interesting as James and the giant peach, so the little girl looks up and listens with frank interest. The teachers notice. You can't sit here like this, okay? Mrs. Lobo says, rustling over. This is not good, okay? Go outside, chalo, go play like a normal child. The little girl circles the football field, squinting in the noonday sun. A little boy sneaks up behind her and tries to place a handful of dried leaves on her head. She whips around and says, stop it. He keeps doing it, arcing his arm like a lamp, giggling in a maddening way. And so she slaps him, bloodying his nose. A teacher sees, and she is sent home with a note safety pin to her blouse to be signed by one of her parents. The note says in round and spiteful hand, did not behave today, slapped fellow pupil badly. Next time, slap him well, her father says. 
In third grade, both she and the little boy who salted her with leaves are now in Mrs. Thurine's class. He's seated at the desk behind her, both of them at the back. Anuj, the boy's name is. Anuj is confident, loud, a jokester. He has a toothy, pretty grin. In front of her sits a boy who has no friends. His name is Karan. Karan has bulbous staring eyes, a lantern jaw, and a stink that nestles close, follows him like a stray. During recess, Anuj asks the little girl if she wants to go on the swings, and she looks shocked, and then shyly says, yes, thank you. They spend homework period at the end of the day making rubber dust, which is what Anuj calls the tiny pink and gray curls left behind in an eraser's wake. They do this every day. They store the clumps of rubber dust in the drawer of the little girl's wooden desk. Let's stare at the sun, Anuj says one day. They lie on a slope of dry grass, and he squints straight up into the sky. The girl covers her face with her hands. I can't do it, she says. It becomes a recess routine. Walk past the football field, past the guari hedges, and lie down together, the girl shielding her eyes with her small palms. The rubber dust production continues. Anuj discovers that sawing a steel ruler across his Faber Castle rubber makes several times the amount of dust. A fourth of the girl's desk is now full of soft shavings the color of organs. They begin sprinkling the rubber dust on Karin's head. Biting lips to keep from laughing, they wait until the teacher's back is turned and pepper it into the naked whorls of his scalp as he bends over penmanship or multiplication tables. Later, neither the little girl nor the person she grows into will remember who started this, her or Anuj. That uncertainty will beat its own tattoo within her, bang its hidden gong of shame. Anuj grows bolder and bolder, dropping rubber dust onto Karan near every time he walks by him. He has begun to get headaches, leaving for hours to sit in the nurse's office. Mrs. Therene says, you need to get your eyes checked, son. Here, take this note to your parents. My parents don't care one fart and I don't need stupid glasses, Anuj yells, kicking Mrs. Therene's desk legs and running out of the room. Later, he shows the little girl the new rubbers his mom has bought. Large, pliable, pinkly beautiful, and they get to work. Anuj's mother arrives the next day, during homework period. Mrs. Therene gives namaste and then says, if I don't hear pin drop silence while I'm in the next room, everyone here will be quite, quite sorry. The little girl scoops a handful of rubber dust from under the desktop and shows Anuj. She's been mixing it with color pencil shavings. Hands outstretched, she, begin, she begins to powder it on Karin's head. Anuj covers his hands with his mouth to muffle his snickering. Karin whips around to face her. Why do you do this? He hisses. His bulging eyes are full of tears. Horror surges through the little girl's limbs, electrifying her in place. Karin's face is twisting, he's swatting at his own head, and the rubber dust and shavings mix dribbles down his forehead and gets into his eyes. He rubs them furiously, letting out a mule of pain. He runs out of the room, hands over his eyes. She turns around. Anuj looks thunderstruck. By now, the other children around them are staring, whispering. The little girl reaches in and sweeps every bit of rubber dust in her desk into the skirt of her pinafore. Sweat prickles in her armpits and down her back. Holding the heaps of dry, gray-pink matter in her skirt, she walks to the dustbin. She shakes out her pinafore, trembling, her ears buzzing. She runs out to look for Karin. When she finds him outside the boy's bathroom, his eyes are a bright and burning red. He hunches into himself the second he sees her. Years later, the person she becomes will look up the word cower in the dictionary and the image of a child's bloodshot eyes, lashes wet with hurt, will surface in her and thrash like a fish. I'm sorry, Karen, the girl says. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She turns his head. He turns his head. She wants to cry. Sorry, please, I'm sorry. 
I won't tell ma'am, is all he mumbles before starting down the stairs, and she doesn't know how to say that that's not it, that him tattling isn't remotely the shape of her fear, that the dark creature that has galloped into her chest and gnaws around her organs might actually be kept at bay if Mrs. Thoreen thrashed her, sent her to the principal's office, wrote, did not behave today across the front of her blouse. She goes back to the classroom. Mrs. Thoreen is marking corrections at her desk. Everyone is still doing homework. Anuj has put his head down on his desk, arms folded above it like a roof. He is very still, but she can hear his occasional sniffle, hear the too fast rustle of his breath. In front of her, Karen's chair is empty, stray curls of rubber dust on its wooden seat. Anuj's mother takes him to get glasses. His headaches persist, racking him with an evil, shelling pain. He and the little girl do not talk much anymore. The little girl sharpens Karin's pencils for him and drops quality street candies onto his desk until, he see, until she sees that he simply throws them away unacknowledged. The little girl goes back to reading books at recess. One day Anuj isn't at school, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. Excuse me, ma'am, where is Anuj, please? The girl asks, voice shaking a little when she brings up her penmanship for inspection. Mrs. Thoreen says that Anuj has to go to a special school for blind children now, that he won't be coming back. On the last day of third grade, the girl's father buys the family their first computer. After school, she turns the machine on and sits in front of the bright hot screen. Her parents are away at work. She marvels at how it lets her erase sentences without using rubbers, so clean and easy, no debris left behind. She stares at the upright blinking line, the swinging door for words to come out of, lifts her fingers to the keys and pushes down. Thank you. It's my distinct pleasure to um, introduce Kamil Hassan. Um, Kamil Hassan has a doctorate in biology from the University of Chicago and is currently a doctoral student in history at Yale. Talk about fancy. <laughs> Originally from Lahore, Pakistan, his work has appeared in The Nation, NPR, Los Angeles Review of Books, Hobart Catapult, and others. Camille and I met because of the um, New Daisy Lit issue, and I have to say it's been rare for me to see someone who is as passionate and tireless as him, as he is in the search to, um, I think, I mean, create, you know, create a world um, that encourages good literary citizenship and um, upholds new and exciting Deshi voices, of which he's definitely one. Okay, how the hell do I follow that? Um, so, Zara is wearing heels, so this is about right for me. Um, I was obvious, my own work was obviously not in the issue, so this is a piece that was published originally in Hobart, and the painting that you see behind me, um, it's, a little, it's a little, it isn't, it, it's not the way it appears, I think, of the bright lights, uh, but Seher also painted this, and it's only one half of a large painting uh, called The Matriarchal Creation of Adam, and it is incredible, and uh, you should come up to us and, and or say her and ask to buy it if you want, because uh, <laughs> I certainly do. Um, this piece is called In Perpetuity. Zed doesn't remember because, despite terrific memory, she never remembers her profundities. The bus ride was otherwise very memorable, our first from Islamabad to Lahore as people who had just lost their virginity. She doesn't remember saying it because she said it nonchalantly and aside in the midst of heady chatter about new sex. Somehow, I had found someone in college. 
I wanted people to see my spectacle. I wanted them to never forget it. We yacked on for hours, giddily, making sure to cover every detail. But at some point during the bus ride, Zed had wondered aloud, what if the joy of experiment dies with joy itself? Two buildings were under construction that winter. The first was the School of Science and Engineering building, of which only half the interior was complete and almost none of the exterior. The second was the sixth addition to the male dormitories. That was where I, was, where I took him. He was a senior and I was a sophomore. He was one of the most beautiful boys on campus and I was, oh, I don't know what I was. Mostly I was nerdy, I had a lot of friends, but most people seemed to worry about me. I befriended them all. He didn't need anyone. He was the first out boy on campus. It felt like everybody was secretly in love with him. I felt like I'd pulled off a bank heist, mischievous, on the precarious reelings of a half-built staircase where I demanded him and put things in places so fast that I have no recollection of ever actually taking off any clothing. We did, of course, amongst the dust and rubble and cement gray pillars. He would always wind up naked first. And he laughed and blushed and chastised me. Once a reeling almost tore straight off, I leaned against it hard, blood draining from me to him. He didn't let me, let me try again in the same place, but I insisted on other reelings and staircases, daunting him, daring him, staring into him as if into a crevasse because all lines were becoming softer and my overguarded interior, the island of my singularity that until now had brought nothing but pain, had begun to disperse and run ahead of me. Like the suggestion of euphoria rushing ahead of this sentence. We fucked in every empty auditorium on campus. When we had sex on the roof of the School of Science and Engineering for the first time, I looked out from the roof of the tallest building for miles in all directions. I ripped his shirt open because I knew instinctively who this boy was in ways no one else did, and I wanted this mean, wretched city to witness me admitting him. There was no queasy shivering, just the rub of me against him. I would hold up this thing to everyone who had ever known me or would ever know me. This verboten, splintered boy who would first exhibit his carnality on the hard edges of a steel cable and drop you down the elevator shaft or throw you over the roof and his belly would fill with nasty delight. At the first, my sexuality proclaimed itself sneeringly, asking, would you dare fuck with me now? Who knew I had it in me? I barely met my friends anymore. One of my closest friends told me she missed me, that she felt I had stopped being friends with her. I told her there just weren't enough hours in the day. Mostly everybody was happy for me, but a little shocked too. I had always been outspoken and bold, but also too tightly wound to be so reckless. He too was a bit busy being shocked. It all went pretty thunderously, my demand of public sex and an unprecedented level of acceptance in college. Love was mentioned a few months in, and. Then it was all we ever talked about. In the meantime, he blew me at the back of a pack bus. We had sex in a room filled with friends pretending to be sleeping. A stranger approached us in my car, parked next to a tree opposite a happy tree of houses. As my hands massaged his bare groin, the stranger told us to leave or wait for the police. I rolled down my window and I laughed in his face. Before I graduated, a security guard told me he used to stand vigil outside one of our regular spots. Because I was kind to him, and he was scared for me. Kind? Scared? Chicago and New York post-college felt like so much freedom. Too much. So I had no use for all that monstrous longing. I've never loved anyone as much as I loved him when the longing settled down. The day I asked him to marry me, a choice Zed did not approve of, it's a rash declaration of love he does not deserve, she said, we fucked in his room because he wanted to. I acquiesced and worried, we were one closed door away from his parents. Months later, I was paying a deposit for a wedding reception at the Lincoln Park Conservatory. And then, in the blink of an eye, the spectacle that had lasted for the better part of a decade evaporated. He drew an eraser over it all. It was gone in a split second, but for years every morning, I woke up and remem remembered, as if for the first time. Zed didn't have to say I told you so. I knew she had hoped she was wrong. Where there was once a vast amphitheater I had opened to the world as my means of power over it, there was only me trying desperately to keep a peephole from shutting. Two years later, another boy kissed me unexpectedly outside the Lincoln Park Conservatory. 
I liked him, but wouldn't allow it. I saw that beautiful, tenuous, salivary thread that connects parting lips and pulled away from all boys. When it was all gone, what was left behind were the entrails of everything that had ever comprised my longing. The suggestion of all that nothing in perpetuity rushing ahead of this sentence. I'd like to invite all the panelists to come up and talk. Um, for those of you who want to read this issue, the link was right up there. And it's going to keep coming up on a loop, so you can find it whenever you want. Please come up here. Yeah. Uh, we all have one sitting here. Hello. I just wanted to say that there's a few seats up here. Yeah. So if you, anyone Do feels like up. sitting, um, we can clear that, even that bench. So there's like seven seats if you want to get close. <laughs> come, 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 come. Come on, Quincy. So we do want to leave space for audience questions, but um, we're going to have a fun discussion because I have a lot of things to ask about something that went down earlier this year and, and you know, the, the DC issue. And I, I don't know if we've mentioned this, but the issue was, actually Abir mentioned this, but the issue was, um, had the rough thematic theme of road trips. And the reason for that was, was that I was so tired of everything that was so self-serious coming out of Desi literature. You know, it took itself so seriously. It had to collide with occupations and apartheid. And sometimes it was just like, I want to read about ordinary South Asian people, right? Like, that's all I want. Um, and so I just chose the first really dumb theme that popped into my head, <laughs> road trips, right? And as it turns out, a lot of people wondered, and I know you, you Sarah, were among them, um, who, was, who were like, what is DC about road trips? So <laughs> the question I want to ask all of you, and we should start with you, Noor, um, is why did you say yes to my solicitation email? <laughs> But actually, um, because I, well, I trusted your judgment, first of all, I n less so my own. But I'd also been desperately looking for a story, like a space that could take stories that I'd had in my head for a long time. And my story, which, again, I didn't read today, but it was, it's in the issue, if, you got, if you're interested in reading it. It's about a team that goes um, on a journey to up to a glacier, and it's about climate change. and. Uh, it's all about sort of this violence that goes down at a glacier. Um, and, for, and for me, I, I sort of always enjoyed the idea of journeys. And at the same time, the biggest journey that, that's, that I feel that I've gone on is, say, up a mountain, because it's hard to climb up a mountain. Mm. And so, the, um, so this sort of experience of combining the, the tra tra travel up, up the mountain with the idea of road trips and with the idea of, like, something changing on the way there was really important. And I wanted to combine it with the Himalayas. And that's sort of what the story is about. And it sort of combined all those factors for me. And again, I wanted to be a part of something that's got such amazing writers and artists in it. So You were a hard get. <laughs> I know that, because I, I was after you for ages, because I was like, I, I have to have her in the issue. Well, I'm, I'm so happy that I agreed. <laughs> um, I just want to start off by saying it's been an absolute pleasure hearing all of these incredible stories and working with such talented people, um, even if I am just meeting them for the first time. Um, but yeah, I remember when Kamil emailed me about um, this issue. I got really excited about it. I didn't actually sort of focus on the details or try to figure out much 
if I'm being honest. I just saw that it was going to be about new Desi literature and, um, and art. And I thought, OK, those are things that I'm passionate about. Those are things that I care about. And it's, it's just so wonderful um, to know that there are people who are working so hard to bring new perspectives to the scene. And um, I thought that, that was something I wanted to be a part of. And then I found out who, was, who else was um, going to be working on this issue. And I realized what the issue was going to be called. And <laughs> everything else was secondary. But yeah. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Um, I think for me it was pretty simple. I think in my own writing and also, you know, the, the times that I've been lucky enough to get published, when I've been published, like, I like to go where, like, where I want to read. You know, I like to write what I want, I try to write what I want to read. And when um, Kamil emailed me and said, you know, like, I'm curating this um, compendium of new, new Daisy literature with original art and with a desire to sort of, like, put push away from like sort of like curry and mangoes like tired tropes um, I was like sign me up because I want to read that and if I get to be a part of it that's so much the better I, I have a phrase uh, mango breasty that's what that's what I call exotified they see literature because so like you know breasts like mangoes um, mango breasty Anyway, this was not going to be I love be how we bookended the readings right. also with our sort of... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, I had a, yeah, a story when... I don't know, any writer maybe, um, or most writers, will never turn down a solicitation from an editor. Because who asks you to be published? Usually you're just like submitting stuff, and then you get rejected. But if an editor actually asks you to submit something, you're not going to say no. Anyway, I wouldn't, say no. I wouldn't have said no. So. I was very scared of her saying no because I was just like, oh, she's not gonna, she's not gonna say yes, which was true for like everyone on the issue. Um, so what I want to ask about is, you know, ever since this has been out in the world and it's been a while now, um, how has this sort of influenced the way we, we've thought? Because I think for all of us, and I think we, you know, we all feel this way, and we, that's why we've been saying it. We created a community of like twenty people. And now we like send each other our work, you know. We like WhatsApp. Every, I have like WhatsApp groups with like everyone in the issue, which is nuts, right? Do you feel like um, what has the response been like for you to your stories in particular, or the art, or the issue in general? Um, so, well, I made new friends, which was nice. Um, but I think most, like, one of the nice things was that. Rarely, and f we all pretty much live in the United States right now, um, but you rarely find a community of people who can, who can read your work at the level that you are at, um, which is to say people who don't, um, don't say things like, as I've experienced, don't say things like, your male character reminded me of a Taliban-like character. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Uh, like, I don't know what that means, but people have said that to my work. Um, in various writing workshops, so it feels I like hear everybody else. Says, like, <laughs> what have you heard from like <laughs> non DC editors? <laughs> like and and these are very well-meaning, very talented people. So it's like it's a world where like you, and, and I'm sure any community experiences this, um, where they're a minority. And I, I didn't grow up in a minority. Uh, I grew up Muslim in Pakistan. So, but at the same time, there wasn't a creative writing community there that I felt I could could or even a creative writing sort of um, a, a, commu a mythology that I could draw from in terms of creative, creative writing. Um, but here, I looked for it, couldn't find it, and now I feel like I found it. Um, and that's been one of the most, the biggest blessings for the, an issue like this. Um, so for me, one of the things that's been really nice, um, one of the things that was really nice while I was working on this, and that I've, um, that I still sort of think back to, was that I think a lot of creative fields tend to be, they can become very insular. You're sort of in your own headspace or you're in your own studio space and you're, you're working on the same image and you're meeting other artists and you're meeting other people, but again, it's your interactions are predominantly limited to either the art world or, I mean, you're just in your studio all day and all night. Um, 
so this was really great for me because it was it was wonderful to work with other creative individuals who were not painters and um, to have this back and forth with them and sort of see how they viewed uh, South Asian issues um, from the perspective of a writer and not from an artist. Uh, so I, I think that was, that was really I also cool. remember like when you had the artist round table, so all of this is, uh, is online, but all the artists, because they didn't interact with each other until they had an artist round table. And I remember Seher me me messaging me over WhatsApp um, when the round table had just started and she was just like, literally the first thing everybody said was, oh my God, all the Orientalist tropes that we have, thank God we don't have to do those, right? Like the self-Orientalizing critique. Yeah. I, and I remember you saying that to me and I was just like, damn. Hmm? I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> if you are, um, so I grew up in Pakistan and then I moved here and then I moved back and then I moved here again. And there's a lot of pressure that goes with being South Asian because people are expecting to see a certain type of art and they're, they're expecting to see a certain type of work and you guys probably feel this way you know, with your writing as well. And when, and I'm sure they're well intentioned. I don't think it comes from a bad place, but I think that when your work doesn't conform to those particular standards, a lot of the value of your work then comes into question, um, which if you are in fact trying to establish yourself is quite problematic. I mean, you don't want the validity of what you're doing questioned that early on. Um, so I think we're caught between a rock and a hard place very often where we have to make work that's sort of they see, but at the same time, we don't, you know, you don't really want to self-orientalize and you don't want to exoticize yourself. And it's, I mean, there are all these questions that you're constantly conscious of. And working on an exclusively they see issue was, was wonderful then because we, it just removed the pressure altogether. It was nice. I've been thinking a lot about Toni Morrison of late, may she rest in power, and um, you know, thinking about her sort of exhortation to herself and other writers of color, black writers in particular, to sort of stand at the edge of the at the edge of the world or stand at the margin and claim it as the center of the world. And I think that, um, you know, it felt very special to be, um, this is something I've been trying to do um, before I was involved with this issue, but it's difficult, and it's difficult because if you're a writer, if you're an artist, it matters, and it's important to feel like you're being heard and you're being understood by the people you're trying to write for. So I would say that, um, it was very special to be part of this issue because I think to an extent it allowed me to take out a few of the variables of this sort of constant translating voice in my head mm -hmm. which always exists um, and isn't even quite as simple as stepping away from a white gaze or a western gaze or an orientalizing, orientalizing gaze. Um, you know, I think being a part of this issue will help me, like um, other people have mentioned, to find an incredible and wonderful community. I enjoy the WhatsApp groups. Um, but they've also, it's also been interesting, both in terms of like what I actually put in the issue, in terms of this, like the story I had has, you know, untranslated Malayalam, which is my mother tongue, which is not the dominant tongue in India. Um, and, you know, people, um, like Daisy people I know messaged me and asked what certain words mean. Um, and I found myself wondering whether I should have translated them. You know, I think the... Uh, <laughs> oh, no. yeah. Thank you, thank we, you. We have some Urdu and Palvashi story, yes. right? There's, yes. She has, there's Palvashi CT is another writer in the issue, and she has untranslated Urdu in like large sections of her, um, of her story and so... Yes. And, and just so, and just in closing in my answer, I guess I would say that like being part of this issue was wonderful and also sort of left me thinking much harder than I had before about what it means to be Desi, you know, what it means to be brown in America. And particularly when you don't fit in every way, the sort of um, 
unified subject that people have in mind. Um, you know, when I um, am an immigrant, I moved to the United States with my family when I was 17. And um, over the years, I've, I've seen tremendous change in how um, people interact with Daisy culture who are not of um, Daisy heritage. And some of it has been positive. Um, but I still get a lot of questions, you know, where like I'll meet someone and they'll say right away, oh, I love Bollywood. And, <laughs> you know, it's, or like, I love yoga. And I want to say, that's great. I did not grow up bo watching Bollywood. I didn't grow up in a Hindi speaking household and I'm the most unfit person in the world. So <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's, uh, I'll stop before I start to ramble, but that's, that's my train of thought on being a part of the issue. I just, yeah, I'll, I'll just say uh, two things. One, one thing I really loved about being on the issue was working with the, uh, the artists that I worked with. Like, it was just such a, an amazing, it wasn't, I don't even think it was a collaboration because um, the artists I worked with, just like, they took my story, read it, and then like came up with this interpretation that was just um, like a translation which I'm always interested in because I work in different genres. So like I feel like all of these pieces and Kamal probably has something to say. It's about funny because yeah. it might come in, come up in the slideshow or it might not. Um, but while Abir was reading, I don't know if you guys saw uh, the fuck all gall art artwork. <laughs> um, I did. I actually did not like it the first time Anam sent it to us, and Abir loved it. Yeah. And it took me I a did. really long time. And then I was just like. Holy shit, it's apocalyptic looking because it's like the female orgasm. And Abir right. was just like, took That's you the long enough. Of the story <laughs> is the female <laughs> orgasm. Right. So, yeah, so it made sense to me. <laughs> you know. Took me a while. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was really interesting, especially with your story and, 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 I, with everyone is really because you, I think we talked about in the end like when we were editing the story and this was like right before it went went live like maybe a few days before where I was like oh I didn't realize that people might like criticize you for having a white protagonist and exoticizing the brown man and we hadn't thought about that because honestly like Abir and I worked on the story you know as like whatever like it's a story like I mean this is it's perfectly fine to write fiction with a wh white female protagonist and she's not exoticizing him and to us we felt very natural to have that well i mean people might have their opinions maybe i did exoticize him but i really mo mostly wanted to objectify him <laughs> rather than exoticize him which i think is okay yeah. I, in some you know, in some circumstances. I remember reading this story with you when oh, there's a, there's an interview in there between Abir and me and like we discussed the story in depth and and I felt like it was, and I hope you guys go and read the ending because it's worth it. Um, it's it's like very much a wish fulfillment fantasy. Um, sorry, that might be a spoiler, but like it's about <laughs> like, it, it it's kind of, it's kind of wonderful to see a story that's happy. That's sort of the, yeah. <laughs> It's like a rom-com. Yeah. It really is a rom-com, yeah. And, and you don't get to see that. Like, I mean, who reads rom-coms, right? I mean, I remember, and so, and Sarah, I remember with us, we had kind of like a, because for one, I was so attached to the mother in the story. So you have to read Sarah's story. It's called The Storms. And I became like uncommonly, unusually, perhaps a little bit bizarrely attached to the mother in a way like my allegiance was with her and I wanted her to be center stage and you know Saraf was like I have another I have a protagonist like an actual <laughs> protagonist <laughs> and I was just like no just give me more of this funny mom <laughs> right <laughs> but you had thoughts on like why that mom character developed the way she did right yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so in terms of like very quick origin of the story and how it developed, um, Kamil mentioned that, you know, the theme was road trips and I was like, road trips, that's such an American thing. It's not what I, what comes to mind when I think about DC culture. And then I was like, wait, 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 take a step back, think about, you know, road trips you've taken. And I started to get this like, vis like initial vision of a, um, you know, man and a woman, like this lazy couple, um, were married. Um, I described it um, later to someone as like 
speculative Jumpala here. Um, <laughs> and I later told her, really? Sara, come on, you're like at this level. Like that's this level. Oh, I think Kamil's, Kamil's showing his no, hand I a was little honestly bit. Just um, like, no, I was honestly just like, do you really like Lahiri? I'm just, oh. no, let's not get into that. Sorry. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I can say it if you don't have to say it. Agree with me. <laughs> um, anyway, but yeah, I just found myself like, I don't know, like starting to write this, um, yeah, this married couple bantering and they were like talking a little bit about their parents and I it just occurred to me that I was not even one percent interested in this husband and I was very interested in this mother you know she just like sort of like marched onto the page um, and so the um, the premise of the story is a little bit like when it when it opens um, Kamala the the narrator is um, sort of faced with the ruin of her apartment that's flooded for the second time and her and her she's a recent widow um her husband akash passed away um in the in the world of um the story the storms of climate change brought his plane plane down um and her mother has sort of forcibly come to live with her you know it, because she's like you're alone and it's not natural for a girl because in her eyes kamala though she's 34 is very much a girl um, for a girl to be alone. And I, I love going where conflict is in stories and in novels. And so just like the like bitter conflict between this mother and daughter um, who, you know, who are both right in their own ways, like I think entirely right based on the cultural logics that they both choose. And because they're both right, it's sort of irreconcilable. I don't know, that kind of like carried me through. And then maybe what um, Kamala is referencing is also, um, I talked a little bit about this in my um, interview in the issue with another writer, Aditya, um, where I was also interested in like trying, trying my best, um, hopefully I succeeded, in writing the kind of um, Indian mom who wasn't a shrew or comic relief or a device to get a character you know, to some kind of closure, you know, I, this, this mother is not based on my own mother, but my, my, my own mother is, uh, believe it or not, um, <laughs> but my own mother is like a fascinating, complex person, you know, she, like, I could write many novels about her, and I would just see like the sort of rah, da, 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 like, you know, like heavy accented Daisy mom in films and books, and I was like, you know, we, we, we deserve something better. I also yeah. want to give a shout out to, if you want to read a takedown of South Asian novelists, Kamal has a piece. <laughs> just, just do a search for Kamal Hassan in uh, just anything, and then you'll find his, uh, I mean, his takedown. I can it's just really fun. The LA Review of Books. Yes. No, it's actually the Chicago Review. Chicago, so the, Chicago. Sorry, Mohammed Hanif. So basically, okay. He takes them all I'll down. tell you the story about it, right? And it actually preceded this issue by like three or four months. Um, and, you know, from all of the reviews I've ever written, this is the one that got like the most supersized response. Some of it bewildering, but mostly people agreed with me. And I was just like, damn, I didn't know people had that many opinions about this. Um, Even if you don't agree, it's still really fun <laughs> to read. You don't agree, Abir? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I basically read his his newest novel, right? And I'm a Mohammed Hanif fan from A Case of Exploding Mangoes. I read his first, that was his first debut novel, and I loved it because I thought just like the ribald, you know, humor, the satire, the, there was just so much, you know, he just goes there, right? Like he, he had like, you know, erotic themes in a, in a case of exploding mangoes. People forget that kind of stuff because, you know, it's like loosely based on Zia and Z Zia's plane crash. But like, yeah, Zia ul Haq dictator. But like, the novel doesn't care about Zia ul Haq, right? Like, it ge genuinely cares about like, I don't know, Uncle Starchy, this guy who's a custodian in the, bu in the novel. And it, so his new novel, The Red Redbirds, is basically like set in a refugee camp, and I and it got really self serious. It got really self serious about terrorism and refugees, and I was just like, I was really bored. But because I was like basically 
paid to be to be reviewing this book. I had to review it, and I just like unleashed like a lot of anger. I'd be like, <laughs> like the only pe- the reason like these people are getting on like like you know long lists is because this is what Western audiences expect. And the weird thing is that is that my criticism of Muhammad Nif actually comes from a place of love because I think he's such an incredible writer, is especially in nonfiction, but also his earlier fiction. Um, and that was totally missed, FYI. People did not recognize that love, but <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, so I'd love to open it up to audience questions. Does everyone have the mics? Who's the writer? Okay, cool. Um, yes, any, sure. Okay, all right, we have the person on the mic. Hey, hi everyone. Hi. So, uh, thank you so much for putting this panel together, Kamo. Thank you all for being here. This was absolutely lovely. Um, I had a question. So you mentioned how one of the, you know, um, part of the thought process behind this collection was, uh, to kind of change expectations around what we should expect from they see literature, they see writers. And I just wanted to get your take on, so to what extent do you feel like the phrase they see literature itself might be an obstacle to, uh, you know, uh, like as opposed to maybe something like literature by they see writers yeah. or something like that? Mm-hmm. And, you know, putting together an anthology of, of literature put together by they see writers, to what extent is that like a structural a structural problem with? There's always a pigeonholing. I've been in a lot of literary conferences and festivals, and there is this idea, you know, you put like the women writers here, or like the Bangladeshi writers here, or the Desi writers. Um, yeah, and it's, it's something I struggle with, because at the same time you want to be like, there's a, a the, um, in the last festival in the Jaipur Lit Fest, they like put all the, you know, like the Assamese writers in one place, and yeah, and the Northeastern writers, Northeastern women writers. You know, like it was like, it's, 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 it's hard to get out of that pigeonhole. And I think frequently, I think frequently uh, we tend to pigeonhole ourselves because one often feels that one can only write about certain groups of people or certain experiences or this is what I'm expected to write about because this is the audience I'm writing for, whether it's a writing workshop or it's... Um, um, I don't know, Twitter or something. Um, so it's, I think it's complicated how one gets out of the pigeonhole um, because it has to come from outside and it has to come from within. And sometimes I think, and this might be controversial, but I sometimes think that when you are stuck inside that pigeonhole, it's sometimes okay to write within that pigeonhole if you write it really well. Um, this is kind of like but it's it, hard. It's hard. Yeah. But yeah, it's hard because you don't want to be like the mango person or whatever. Yeah. But <laughs> but like I've certainly said things that that are probably self exoticizing, which I wrote maybe five years ago. And now I read them and I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't have written that. But I didn't realize it at the time. So I think like you're constantly sort of evolving as you write and trying to and, and for me, it certainly helps to read, read and talk to and and sort of imbibe experiences that are not my own and like try to be, uh, try to sort of understand worlds that are not my own and just read as much as I can. And I think that helps, I think every writer will say just read, read, read. Um, So I think that kind of helps me sort of write outside the pigeonhole or at least try to push what's the hole that I'm in, push it and make it bigger kind of thing. So to your point, I mean, it, it's a great question and one that I think actually in the interviews in the, in the issue, a lot of people do, ha- ha- a lot of the writers do take issue with the word Desi and don't particularly identify as Desi writers even though they're in this issue. Where it was almost like a tongue-in-cheek sort of like banner, this Desi issue, right? But to your point, two things, right? The first is we can, we can pretend all we want that we've gotten rid of the lab- label, but the truth of the matter is that the way people perceive us is often how we are expected to behave a lot of the time. And whether we conform to that or not is kind of, you know, it's kind of our decision, but there are ramifications to it, right? So for instance, when I, so one thing you can do is you can resist it forever, 
or you can try to expand the umbrella, right? So I remember when I first solicited, you know, all these people, I was like, give me your experimental, give me your avant avant-garde, give me your erotica, your horror, your, you know, like all those things that I don't, I just don't associate with Desi literature, that I see a lot of other traditions doing, show them, right? And if we can maybe broaden that umbrella and expand our, I mean, you could expand it to like whatever, like it includes everything, right? Um, but stepping away from it, to me personally, and I know people disagree with me, stepping away from the term entirely, um, it does, doesn't always feel productive, you know, or like a conversation, conversation I want to have, per se. And could I add also that I think that we're all saying this speaking in a space which is uh, predominantly English speaking, predominantly from, uh, uh, and I can't speak for everyone, but uh, most writers I encounter come from, say, English educated backgrounds. I think we have to constantly sort of, um, we are trying to expand the umbrella within the space we exist in, mm -hmm. but we come from, um, uh, I guess, literary cultures that have, that have existed way before English and that we draw from, but we are also influenced by Western literature, evidently, considering the language we write in. So I think that there's, um, there's constantly a, a, a battle between, like, the identities we have here, the identities that we come from, the languages that we come from, but that we haven't exactly embraced yet in our literature, and we're trying to find ways to bring it all together. And so it's, it's, a, it's a constant, I think, struggle and negotiation, but I think that's what, I guess, literature is always, and language is always, so. Hi, um, thanks for organizing this. I think my question, Noor, you kind of touched upon it, but I just wanted to hear a little bit about sort of your struggles. So we heard about what you enjoyed and you know why this effort was so great, but what were the tough things or what did you find the most challenging in, in this process? Revision. <laughs> um, I think that for, for this um, story in particular, I think it was like pretty smooth compared to some, you know, some things I've written where I've, you know, have like 18 versions and open questions I can't resolve. Um, I think it says a lot about, you know, the team, the team behind the issue. Um, but I, um, I'm interested in sort of like answering the question broadly and sort of struggles that I have with the writing process in general. Um, and I think a big one, and it touches in some way um, on the things that we've been talking about, is um, a certain kind of split screen vision of myself. Um, I was reading this book by uh, um, the, the theorist and writer John Berger recently, and it's called Ways of Seeing, and it blew my mind. And there, he has this um, one line in there, um, and he's talking about men and women. And the line, if I'm remembering right, goes something like, to be a woman is to be born in a confined and enclosed space into the keeping of men. And then he goes on to describe the w all the ways in which, if you are a woman, and he's speaking in generalizations, and he's also, this book is written, you know, in a time when there was really not real consideration of, um, more than you know of of a gender identity spectrum wider than the binary but he goes on to kind of talk about how for the category of women there is this split consciousness and one is her is, is her acting as a woman and the sort of the i within herself and then the other part is this i that hovers outside herself and surveys herself according to the view, according to like the eye of men. And it's a self-protective mechanism. And I, I think that when I read that, I sort of had a series of small explosions in my head. And I thought, I, I have multiple of those split, you know, split consciousnesses. You know, I think that ever since I was very young, I was always surveying myself and my actions you know, I think along a gender line, along a race line, along a sexuality line, and um, out of a desire to be seen for what I was, out of a desire to be to feel protected. So I think what I struggle with in my writing and process is 
which of the eyes do I choose? You know, can I, and often, I, I, I think we're in a cultural moment, blessedly, where I can sit on a couch and someone can say, no, don't translate, you know, like, and um, just write for yourself. But I think that just the, f the fact of life is most of us are writing with audiences in mind. And if you go, if I go hyper, hyper, hyper specific, my audience narrows and narrows and narrows. So I think that's, and if I, if I write with an eye, with sort of choosing all the external surveilling eyes outside me, if I go too far, then I end up with like the mango, the mango tit literature, you know, like I. Um, so yeah, I think that's sort of the eternal struggle, like how, like what kind of, what kind of rope do you walk um, to make something real, to make something that can live outside you? Yeah, I mean, to, to, to Sarah's point, I actually, I feel like, so this is something that I've been struggling with. I mean, so to your question, as an as an editor for this issue, you know, because I generally I wear the writer hat, like especially now I'm not editing at all. Um, you know, now I'm just thinking completely differently. But when I was an editor, of course, the real difficulty was, you know, having 13 conversations, 12, 12 conversations with 12 writers, and then 12 conversations where, where the writers were talking with the artists, and then another conversation with the artists with each other and then like it, it was just a lot of stuff so organizationally it was a humongous challenge because we have stories we have art and then we have conversations that's what the issue is made up of um but as a writer i think the major thing that i find difficult and i think this is something that i loved navigating with people because they helped me figure it out um is ambivalence right so i remember reading um an essay by Zadie Smith, and I forget what what the essay was called, but she has a, she has a whole book called Changing My Mind, so it was probably in there, um, where she basically like launches an argument for ambivalence, right? And I think one of the fundamental things that I find about writing is that whenever I put something, whenever I put pen to paper, so to speak, I don't actually write in longhand, but um, whenever I put pen, pen to paper, what emerges a lot of the time are like refracted versions of myself, right? And that is something, like that's like a sort of writerly trope, like, you know, we, all, we are constantly writing versions of ourself. But the truth of the matter is that we're always constantly writing the bajillion versions of ourselves who've been oscillating in, in time between one decision and another, right? And so it's really hard for me, when I'm writing, it's very hard for me to start discerning what what me is, right? It, because I, I, I feel like in order to inhabit my characters, I kind of have to let myself go. You know, I kind of have to just be like, you know, like, screw Kamil, he's not part of this. You know what I mean? Like, and I find that really hard, but when it gets hard, then I'm just like, okay, now I'm getting somewhere. And I think that was something that I felt like everyone in the issue did really, really well. Like, they just sort of went there to that hard place. Yeah, it was another question somewhere there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so my question is kind of about like promoting your work with non daisy audiences, I guess. So Noor, you talked about when you shared your work with like prominent non daisy readers, they said, oh, your protagonists seem like the Taliban or something like that. So I mean, did you take it upon yourself to correct that, or are they just entitled to their own interpretations of your work? Like, where do you go from there? That is actually, the conclusion to that story is actually really funny and went in a direction that I did not expect it to go because the professor who correct, who she actually called me directly after that and said, oh, you know, I guess I put my preconceived notions on your story. And I was like, oh, that's nice of you. And, you know, she's like, turns out I dated a guy from Afghanistan. And he reminded me of this guy. And that guy actually worked with the Taliban. And I was like, that is not where it went. <laughs> and I was like, this is not where I expected this conversation to go. But I mean, good for you to call me Damn. and talk to me about this. But anyway, um, it. <laughs> I think in the early days of any workshop or any community where you're writing and you happen to be the minority, you're always, um, you, you, you encounter people constantly who say, I don't think this character would do this because, um, because it doesn't make sense to me based on like what I know of their culture. 
and that happened all the uh, that happened all the time. I was like, what do you know about their culture, and how does what their their actions? Why do you think assume it's always influenced by their culture? Like, I sitting here will not act the way my uh, perception of a Pakistani woman is. Like, I might go there and drink some wine. Who knows? Like, you know. So, <laughs> it's like I might. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This is being live streamed, so it's. I, like, I'd love anyway, to see Seher's response to this also because <laughs> yeah. we were our issue was lucky enough to. Um, get early reviews and one of the things that an early reviewer said was that you know okay well some of the art is very desi in terms of like it's fun truck arty etc etc but the but a lot of it most of it is not right and the stuff that you're seeing up here some of it's very like desi traditional but some of it's really not and i felt like seher's work in particular um sort of hit upon that so yeah I'd before like i hand it to sir i didn't answer the question directly but i think that ultimately the hope is that you can write for you should write for yourself and then hope that gradually like at least i believe that there are a lot of audiences out there who are looking for the exact same thing that we are looking for and i think the internet helped me find those people or find those readers i mean it certainly helped me connect with a lot of the writers sitting here and um and it was certainly better than it was say 5 years ago the community of writers online so in terms of art um i feel that what you said earlier about ambivalence is is really important because i think a point you get to a point where you just have to let it go and you just have to make the work that needs to be made and you just have to trust your instincts and if it works well and good and if people don't like it then it is what it is um and i think a certain point comes when when you do start owning what you're doing and you start owning your work other people um external audiences as well they start to respond to it the way you want them to because they they see your vision eventually if you're true to what your vision is i mean if you're um if you're creating from a confused perspective yourself or this tight you know balancing yourself on the tight rope sort of um position then your work is also going to reflect that so i think you do just have to let go at some point and make what feels right i i sh- i want to add really quickly to your question which is it's a really great one and i think the pe- the pe- people who critique it who critique dc writers for um there was a great moment that happened during the issue so we have a critique for dc writers who seem to be pandering to western audiences right and hasantika sirisena she's an american sri lankan writer um she had a graphic short story in the issue which was amazing i loved it but there was a moment in the interview where she was just like you know well you know kamal's critique of mohammad hanif is not new Kamal stop like stop acting like it's new this has been the same critique that we've been we heard a decade before we heard a decade before that and i was just like i mean it, she was half insulting me but i actually was a little flattered by that because i feel like that if that is something that we see as a lineage of criticism right then we can kind of start to pick apart the fact that like okay well we're not crazy right like we're not nuts for thinking that we should do this or should not do that right Hi um I am curious as uh, as artists who your main and desi artists who your main influences are are they other desi artists are they non-white artists are they you know from a different generation are they sort of newer artists Do you mean uh, fine artists uh, writers or writers. Uh, other forms of art uh, Yeah okay. <laughs> Um so I think that so I actually went to art school here and um that means that I never studied art in Pakistan and my first exposure to art was outside of Pakistan and I, I and this also obviously predates um my undergrad you know when you travel you go see museums and the western world knows how to document art and exhibit it and unfortunately our part of the world doesn't so we don't really grow up seeing very much local art um It's it's ironic I've actually seen more South Asian art over here than I have in like all the years I've lived in Pakistan. <laughs> um but so I think I started off looking at a lot of western artists but then when I moved back I was you know I, I realized that there's a store of there's this enormous store of talent over there and incredible work that's being made and so I started then also looking at a lot of um Desi artists. uh from South Asia not just Pakistan 
And I, the way the art world has evolved, and I'm sure this is true for writing as well to a certain extent, is that there's so much overlap and so many ideas flow into each other that it, at a certain point, it all just becomes current work as opposed to work pertaining to one specific region. Um, while still maintaining that, that cultural quality, which is, I think, really beautiful. But yeah, so it's, it's just a mix for me at this point. Yeah, I think that I, and I suspect many writers are bad at sort of like, honestly identifying their like true influences. I think it's easier for me to talk about who I admire and who I read a lot, um, you know, a, a lot of um, with no expectation that my writing um, is anywhere near as good as theirs or looks like theirs. Um, I mean, I, I grew up like reading a lot of the sort of like, I don't know, like I read a lot of, you know, Arundhati Roy, who is from my hometown in India, um, meant a lot to me. A lot of my like early fiction was like a oh, horrendous aping of her style. Um, Salman Rushdie, uh, Salman Rushdie was very important. Um, v. S. Naipaul, um, in in my mind, like V. S. Naipaul, Saul Bellow, um, even Charles Dickens, like um, sort of like combined to kind of form and and in recent years, Elena Ferrante combined to create in in my mind this like sort of like mini canon of like the great individual epics, you know, and I, I loved reading those books because I think um, when I was younger, I, I just felt like, you know, I as a self was this sort of like bottomless ocean. I didn't really understand, and maybe other people in the room know what this feels like, and I didn't really understand myself. It, I just felt very multiple, and I loved the sort of concentration of focus of like, you know, this like big, fat, like 900 page novel on a single person. Um, so, um, but I've also been really excited in recent years by seeing, you know, like, it, it's, I think it's an incredibly exciting time for fiction for so many reasons. Like I think back to when I was in high school and everyone was predicting the death of publishing and print and fiction. And there's so much good stuff that's happening. And of late, I've been very interested in auto fiction and the auto fictional mode, you know, Ben Lerner, Ocean Vuong, all the rest of it. Um, I think when you said influence, I immediately thought, oh, who's, like you were saying, who's the person I read in childhood and was like, oh, I want to be like them. But now I think of influences like, while I'm writing, who am I reading? Um, and it, there was, I wrote a ghost story a few years ago. Um, and while I was, uh, while I was writing that, I couldn't, I was struggling so much throughout it. But I decided, like someone recommended to me, um, Pedro Paramo, which is a, it's a Mexican um, novella, um, essentially a ghost story. And it was the hardest thing I've ever read. Like, I had to go back and reread it. I didn't get most of it, what was going on half the time. And I wouldn't call it like a book that I, a book that I ever loved. I didn't love it at all. It was extremely difficult. But as I was reading it, I found it easier and easier to write about something that was kind of like it, because it was about a, a man who goes through cities of like uh, villages where people are dead and he's not sure who's alive and who's dead. And we're not sure if you're in the past or in the present or even in the future. And, and so it, there, are, there are lots of books. As a writer, I find that there are books that exist for you as an individual that help you write. And there, there are books that exist that you really enjoy. And sometimes there are books that do both. Um, and, and I found that, that, that it's wonderful to be able to have that ability to see things, sort of read others' work differently. Um, and, and as far as like being influenced like in broader, broader ways beyond your writing, I think that I never felt like anything could describe history or politics or anything about the world more accurately than what I read in literature. And that's kind of why writing made the most sense to me is because I read so much of literature. And, and, in, and interestingly enough, I never actually started reading or trying to enjoy um, Urdu novels until I, was an, until I was older. I was forced to read it in school, and then by in my 20s I decided to actually read it for enjoyment and for pleasure, which was hard because I hadn't read Urdu in a long time. Um, and when I got into it, there was this um, novel, um, it was Dickensian in its style, um, 
Khuda ki basti, which um, which means um, God's colony, um, and so that novel, like reading it from beginning to end and taking the months that it took me, I realized that this is like how um, this is how one can tell like. You know, we have the idea of the great American novel, um, and I wouldn't call it the great Pakistani novel because it was too close to post-partition and too um, sort of too broad in its scope. Yet, as a as a place, of, as a story of a tortured city in in Pakistan, but also it was so specific to certain experiences and and the range of of experiences it took in there. It had religious extremism, it had socialism, it had um, it had uh, sexism, it had all these sort of themes woven through it that I was like this the level of richness here like I would only can aspire to sort of try to find something that covers this depth and breadth of storytelling um, so that's like one novel that sort of really stuck out to me as an adult as to this is how I'd want to try to write in the future yeah um, just I'm going to quickly answer that question I you know, I'm more recent into the fiction world than these people are. So my inspirations have mostly been non nonfiction, like, because I got my start in journalism. And so I I'm going to, like, list off investigative journalists, but nobody wants to hear that. So, um, but I can tell you, like, because I've been marking this down for the last few years, like, who has, like, changed my life in terms of, like, when I read them. So Elena Ferrante. And then I have a huge obsession for francophone writers and, um, the Latin American tradition, so Borges, Aira, and then in the in the Francophone tradition, like Matthias Ennard, uh, Marie Ndaye, I just I'm I'm obsessed with them, and I the most recent um, has been Kurutula and Heather, who I read in English, and I mean it's it is difficult in English. So I'm not even going to try reading it in Urdu <laughs> because I can't do that. Um, and But I mean, the weird thing is, is that even though I'm, as an academic, I, I feel like I should have academic-ish interests, right? I don't particularly until I got to Kurutil and Heather. And I was just like, this woman is telling, the, she told the history of the, of the entire subcontinent, 2,000 years of history in one book. Right, how she crystallized that—it's—it's it's a history lesson that like everybody needs to needs to have. Like, make your so it's Kurutala and Heather in English. It's River of Fire, uh, in Urdu it's Akadaria, and um, you everybody should read it. It should be like on everybody's course course lists, right? Like, because that is that's how important that book is. So that's what I would flag is something that, I mean, I don't know if it's going to be an influence on me, but I hope so. <laughs> so one more question, guys. Last question. We've talked you guys out. <laughs> We've tired you out. Oh, Others? Oh, well, my Sorry? I didn't see. Oh, okay. This isn't like a real question. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know the title of the book that you were talking about again. Uh, the book I was talking about? Yes. Wonderful. That seems like a nice place to wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for coming, and let's hear it for the panelists. And thank you all. If you guys want to talk about the art or any of the stories or anything else that you, you just want to shoot the shit, like come up to us and we will um, do that. We also want to thank Kamil for being the reason why we're all sitting here. Um, he brought us all together. He con conducted an exhaustive search of a lot of writers, and for some reason, he picked us. And this is—it's really been a pleasure. And um, obviously, all the artists you see up there who are not here, Seher's here, but there's a bunch of artists here who you're not uh, who. Um, uh, have not been able to speak about their work and they are absolutely amazing you should check out their work you should check out the barrel house issue the link is there somewhere right there. and of course um, Asian American Writers Workshop Jyoti Bushra Tiffany the whole team here has been amazing and thank you guys so much for putting this together <laughs>